Kérem, fogadják nagy szeretettel a Cooper Intézet tudományos munkatársait, Catherine Wowald, Gregory J. Welkett, Kevin Fint és Pedro St. Maurice. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you. It's my pleasure to open up our presentation for the Cooper Institute. On behalf of my colleagues, we thank the Hungarian School Sport Federation for your kind invitation. Dr. Cooper, Dr. Dufina, Mr. Don Disney for your leadership throughout this project, and all of you for your kind attention. Joining me in sharing the scientific basis of NetFit are Kevin Fenn, Pedro St. Maurice Moduro, not in attendance but equally involved, Kelly Larson, Greg Welk, and Wei Mo Zhu. Also key to the success of this research has been the Hungarian team. I have been so very honored to work with all of these individuals. I will be back at the end of the presentation to share some of the uses of health-related fitness data in instruction and in the school setting. But now I turn it over to Kevin Finn. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I, again, I uh, say to you, thank you for your uh, invitation to come and present our data. Today, what I'm going to do is present, make sure I have this uh, in my hand, present to us this, uh, an overview. And it's going to be a short overview because I want to make sure we get to the data, um, the overall design and the Hungarian study. Um, I served as a consultant, uh, and I'm going to specifically look at the quality control component of this study. Oops, song. Okay. Um, first of all, the partnership was established and uh, began the discussion in uh, January of 2013, and it was uh, initially a meeting uh, in Dallas, Coop, uh, Dallas, Texas, with the Cooper, uh, uh, the uh, Hungarian Sports, uh, excuse me, School Sports Federation, and the Cooper Institute. And you can see on this on this uh, photo, um, it began uh, this initial meeting began the discussion and the, the first stages of the planning. And uh, at that point, um, we had a lot of good conversation, but yet we had to determine a lot of details. Sorry, just let's try it again. Go ahead and advance for me, please. Apparently, I'm not hitting the right button. I'm sorry. Oh, no fun there. Okay. Thank you. Again. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I am obviously challenged by the technology. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is identify that this is uh, the research design involved a cross sectional and it, and it, and it did a, uh, a multi stage randomization of, of, of the subjects. The first thing we had to do is this obviously establish uh, from a national sample. Uh, for the representation study, um, a number of schools that would participate in, and through the uh, leadership of the Hungarian uh, School Sports Federation, they identified uh, through recruitment uh, schools that would be involved. Uh, there was a total of uh, 53 schools that were contacted. Three did drop out, uh, but we ended up with 50 different schools involved, and you can see through the seven different regions of Hungary. Um, from that, we uh, began a, a random sampling of, of subjects in that school. Um, and from that, to ensure that we had good uh, clustering, uh, we looked at age grouping. Uh, the grades were five through nine, but the, the age categories were 11 through 19. And we uh, made sure that we got uh, both boys and girls involved in the study. Now, one of the things that was important, and I, I think uh, uh, Zoltan Toth for introducing this component, that we did include both laboratory measurements as well as the field measurements. Please advance. Sorry, I'm OK. Thank you very much. Uh, what you see here is a uh, representation of the data that was done in the field. Um, our goal was to get 2,500 students. We actually ended up with more than that. And after uh, looking at the data um, of what was collected, um, through cleaning up some of the data, we ended up with actually 2006, uh, 2,602. Um, you notice there's a distribution across the age categories. 
uh, fairly equal distribution between boys and girls. And you see there's a, a good separation on percentage-wise between the age categories. I just want to note that some of the 19-year-olds were still in high school, and of course that uh, is, may not be a typical age for every high school, so therefore obviously the, the N is smaller, the percentage is, is lower in that category. Advance. Um, in the field measurements, um, each school uh, was prepared and there were laboratory, uh, excuse me, there were field measurements done in the situation. Uh, we conducted the, they conducted a different pacer uh, through one station and then they separated into four different groups. And I'm not going to provide much detail here, but one of the things that my job was to evaluate the organization of this and they were, their, their task was to uh, test a number of kids in a very short period of time. So of course quality was an issue here. Uh, you notice that there are, there are examiners very close to the kids observing and obviously instructing them on how the right procedures should be done. In our laboratory, the distribution uh, was to get a sample uh, and of course a subsample. Our goal was for 500. Um, we you ended up after the cleaning of data, 482. Uh, you'll notice again a good distribution of the age categories and, and gender. Okay. Um, in the laboratories, um, there was a need to obviously coordinate uh, um, a number of tasks to evaluate metabolic syndrome. Uh, we looked at a measure of oxygen consumption uh, using a treadmill test. We ended up going to maximal exertion on that. Uh, we did um, anthropometric measurements, uh, skin fold, waist circumference. Uh, we added uh, a measure of impedance, both laboratory. Uh, in this case, a body composition measure uh, to repeat the field measurement, but also a laboratory measure. And we took uh, blood pressure and blood samples to determine blood chemistry, as well as uh, some of the issues related to uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, as far as the quality control plan, it was important for our, uh, early on to decide that we we're going to go out and visit. And as a, as a consultant, um, I was uh, recruited to go out uh, to visit, uh, come back to Hungary and visit, and um, my job essentially was to make site uh, observations. And so we, we created a uh, evaluation plan in which we would actually evaluate the staff, we would look at the conditions, we would look at the level of organization, and we'd also look at the, how the data was transferred, both uh, on the uh, test, uh, the sample child by child uh, uh, da uh, data set as far as the uh, the sheet, as well as how it got uh, transferred to the uh, central uh, processing center in, in Budapest. Um, one of the things that was important is that we did, we were able to subjectively evaluate some of the competency, and I think that's what's important here, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, the findings of the quality control was really based on a, a concept of consistency uh, when you do multiple site. Uh, measurements, it's, it's critical that we try to be consistent. And so the, the words consistency are implied, um, how do we do within a, a laboratory or within a uh, field measurement site, as well as between. Um, my ratings here are, are basically subjective, not don't provide scores, and, and in this case it, it just provided the ability to go back to both the Cooper Institute as well as give feedback to the Hungarian School Sports Federation about the quality of the data measured. Um, I provided a, in my report, a very good inter-field test consistency, which really uh, was a good score. And in this case, it was based on they were well organized, they did follow the, the uh, manual that was provided them and the instructions. They made the, t the children very comfortable, and I think that was very important. They had clear instructions. And in, in my observations, they did very good uh, measurements, uh, and they, they were very accurate at recording those measurements. Um, there were some variability uh, within between teams, but, but really one of the things I thought was they had very good subject interaction. So I think obviously different, there was, different, there was five different teams I observed, and, and with that I guess there's always going to be different people, but they all did a very uh, professional job. Within the uh, laboratories, I was very impressed with the four laboratories I did visit. I only was able to uh, observe four of them during the testing period. Uh, one of the things, of course, is that we want to have consistency equipment, we want to have consistency in the, in the protocol, and of course we want to have all staff that has high skill and, and of course, merit. Um, I give an excellent uh, evaluation of this because of the, the testing sequence was a, a basically 
uh, right on target according to the protocol. Um, I noticed that there was a consistent uh, standardization and calibration. Um, the staff was easily, uh, highly experienced. They obviously had a lot of previous experience doing testing in children, and the facilities were excellent in all situations. The, the last issue is fair, and of course you might view that as not as, as favorable, and I think fair is still a good, good measurement, but that said, um, there's always going to be an intra-laboratory, between laboratory, consistently concern. For our specific uh, concerns were based on body composition, and it had to do mostly with the different equipment that we had at each one of the laboratories of the, of the four laboratories I observed, and I noticed that the fifth one also had similar problems. And then, of course, with any anthropometric measurements, there's always going to be differences between the examiner from one person to the other. So this was the only concern to advance. So my conclusions are really based on uh, three points. Um, first of all, I, I think the data is of high quality. And it's specifically important to mention that there was a lot of training that had to go on in a very short period of time. So I compliment the Hungarian School Sports Federation for their ability to, to organize uh, a number of teams to standardize uh, the process, to train them, and of course, in my observation, to see that they did very well. Uh, secondly, I think obviously there's going to be potential differences between sites, and of course, within that, some of the recommendations are based on we might want to consider regional distribution versus the whole uh, country as a whole. And then finally, um, one, our main concern, one of our concerns, specifically when we link uh, field measurements to laboratory measurements, is is what might happen if you look at body composition. And so, of course, that said, there's possible variance that might be due to the measurement itself. So I'll go ahead and stop here, and I'll go ahead and advance the slide, and I'll let my colleague, uh, Dr. St. Uh, Maurice, continue. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so this is the fun part, where I'll start showing some of the data. We've been talking about evidence. And this is the point where we start showing how the results and how the standards and the fitness test items apply to the Hungarian population. And it gets really interesting. So I'll start talking about the validity of the standards, and I'll move on and start talking about the specific validity of each fitness gram test item, or at least for aerobic capacity and body composition. Uh, so first of all, um, I want to reinforce that this was a sample used for lab testing, so a subsample of 400 individuals, okay, where they went to the lab, they were measured on several lab tests, and we were able to match lab scores with either the standards or the test items. So let's start with this. There's three things I want to get from this table, okay? The first thing is that um, the most prevalent risk factors in Hungarian boys are total cholesterol, blood pressure, and triglycerides, okay? In girls, total cholesterol, blood pressure, and waist incurvance. Now, the second thing is if a child has three or more of these factors, or the others on the table, they are considered to have metabolic syndrome, okay? And that's kind of our criterion measure to define what is the disease status of a specific child, all right? And the last piece is the prevalence is actually pretty low in Hungary, okay? You can see that in boys, mostly 6%, and when we look at girls, it's almost like 8%, okay? So that's the most relevant information. Now, the other piece, and I can show you here, we also wanted to be sure that whatever criteria we're using to define the metabolic syndrome in children were also true in adults. So we actually started looking for some data available. And we did find some data available for adults. And interesting enough, the same most prevalent risk factors in boys and girls that I just mentioned are exactly the same ones in men and women. So we felt confident. Our classification of metabolic syndrome was actually pretty robust. Okay? So that's why we ended up using it. Now, let's get into the results. And I think it's probably important to start with this graph, which is a conceptual idea of how this works. How do we actually test that the standards might work uh, and if they have the relation with metabolic syndrome? So in a vertical axis, you have cardiovascular function or measured oxygen consumption, okay, which is familiar to some of you. On horizontal axis, you have age. So the fitness gram and the Cooper Institute have developed standards based on this, uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this indicator, cardiovascular function. So you can see that the blue line is considered to be the healthy fitness zone. That means every child that scores at or above that blue line, or for that specific score for cardiovascular function, will be defined as being in a healthy fitness zone. All right, so they have good scores for health. All right, now, if they score between the blue line and the black line, then you say that, well, 
you know, you add some risk, so you are in the needs improvement zone. So that's how the standards work. And finally, if they do score below the black line, then they are at risk. Also, the needs improvement zone, high risk. Okay, so that's good to start with. Now, how do you look at the agreement between each of these thresholds and metabolic syndrome? And there's three things, again, <laughs> that you can keep in mind. So they are called sensitivity, and that's SE, specificity, and the odds ratio. Okay, and I'll try to keep this really simple. Now, sensitivity relates to the utility of the threshold to identify children that do have the disease. Okay, so based on this case, you can see that a children that scores below that blue line, okay, you can see that 58%, as indicated by the sensitivity, 58% of the children that score below that threshold, they do have metabolic syndrome, all right? The second piece, specificity, relates to the utility of the threshold to identify a child that does not have a disease, okay? And in this case, you can see there, a child that scores at or above that blue line or the threshold, okay, you can see that 79.6 or 80% of those kids, they do not have metabolic syndrome. So that is telling us something, correct? More interesting is the last criteria, which would be the odds ratio, which is 5.5. And this is kind of a really good indicator because it kind of makes a relation between sensitivity and specificity. So in other words, it tells what are the risk of a child that scores below the blue line, so that's sensitivity, compared with a child that scores above the blue line. And that's 5.5. That means a child that scores below the blue line will be 5.5 times more likely to have metabolic syndrome. So if you're in a PE setting and you have a class and you grab 10 students that did score below the blue line and you grab another 10 students that score above, if you found that in the group that score above the blue line or in the healthy fitness zone, that there's one that has metabolic syndrome, you can expect to at least find five in the other group. So that's how indicative it is. So it does tell us that the standards do work for this population. And you can see the same principle applies for the other zones. And just to show you, I mean, the same type of analysis will show you that, for example, a child that scores below the black line that needs improvement high risk zone will be even higher, seven times more likely to have the disease condition. Okay, so this is kind of association we're looking for, and that's actually what we found in the Hungarian sample, which is very similar to what we found in the US. Okay, so that was giving a, a, a lot of confidence on what we're seeing and to what extent the standards would work for this population. So you can see here, these are the same results. You can see since the specificity and the odds ratio, that's for boys, so that's just the example I just provided you. Okay, so we're done with that. And then there's girls, and you can see the odds ratio, probably that's the easy indicator to focus on. 2.7 and 3.3, a little bit lower, but also in the same direction. Girls that do score below or not in the healthy fitness zone, their risk for metabolic syndrome will be higher. Okay, that was consistent in the Hungarian population. We did the same kind of analysis for body fat, percent body fat, okay? And you can see here the odds ratio again. I mean, they're not as high as we found for aerobic capacity, but they're still relevant, and I'll show you one of the reasons why. And it has to do kind of with the test item used for body fat, okay? But as we do in the US, we mostly use BMI. And this is the reason why. Look at the odds ratios. Okay, 5.1, 10.3, 4, and 8. So these are pretty clear that if your BMI is not in the healthy fitness zone, you'll be at risk for metabolic syndrome. So, or in other words, if you, don't, if you don't have a good score for health, you most likely to have high triglycerides, high blood pressure, and, um, <laughs> and um, high blood pressure, high, high cholesterol, and... Um, High circumference, sorry, waist circumference, okay? So that's very relevant for a clinical setting, and that's why this is really useful. Now, and I can get in the next, in the next piece. We also start looking at the validity of the test items, and again, for aerobic capacity and body composition. So we start looking at the pacer, which is the shuttle run, which I'm suppose you are, some of you are familiar with, or most of you are familiar with, and the BIA, which is bioimpedance analysis. And the same subsample that went to the lab they did the max VO2 treadmill test, and they did the, the field test, the PACER, or the BIA. And I'll show you the results. So it gets really interesting. So, but first, let me explain what this means. So the way we look at the agreement between the two tests, we look at the agreement at two levels. It's called individual level and group level. So individual level means to what extent can we predict a specific score for a child. So that means if I had to guess on the age of each one of you in this classroom, and I could get any information other than age, of course, right? Height, weight, uh, how much sleep you get, even how much travel you did last year, okay? 
I was going to try to use that information and see to what extent I could use that information to predict each, each age for each one of you in this classroom. And that's quite challenging, you can guess that, right? But we can do it. And the same applies to pacer and aerobic capacity. We do the same. So that's individual level. At the group level, we use that information. Each individual guess I did for each one of you, I can combine that information, just get an average score, and see to what extent that only single value gets closer to the true value of your age. Okay? So you might end up that we actually get pretty close, and that's very good, actually. Okay? So that's in between individual and group level. The same applies with pacer and body fat. To what extent can we predict cardiovascular function on each kid? And to what extent those combined scores can be used to reflect a classroom score? All right. So given that said, this is really important because then what matters is the implications of my guesses and to what extent I get closer, to what extent the pacer can predict aerobic capacity or cardiovascular function or body fat. To what extent does that has implications when you're classifying children or students into the healthy fitness zones, right? That's what matters. That's what we want to know. So I'll show you that as well. So that will be my last piece of the results. So let's start with aerobic capacity. This messy graph, I know it's not as pretty. I tried to make it as pretty as I could. But it's showing on the vertical axis, okay, it's showing cardiovascular function measured in the lab, all right? On the horizontal axis, cardiovascular function measure, measured in the field by the PACER test. So if they were to agree exactly, you'd expect a straight diagonal line, meaning it doesn't matter where you do the test, the score will be the same. We know that that's really hard, or actually impossible, but we want to get as close as we can, right? So you still see a straight line showing that if a child scores high on the lab, you can expect that he'll score high in the field or in the P setting on the test you're using, right? So that's really important, okay? And that's that red line, okay? Of course, you're gonna have some error, right? You're gonna see some dots that uh, well, the true score is actually pretty high, but you predict to be pretty low, just like my guest estimate. So maybe I'll say, Dr. Cooper, based on my model, his edge will be pretty low, 45, 50s. But actually, um, he's a little bit above that. Not too much, though, but a little bit above. And that's just because my model was using information. Well, he traveled so much last year, he has to be a young, a young person, right? Okay? The same thing works the other way, right? I could say that, for example, Tomas, right? My model would say that, the true value of Tomas is actually is pretty old just because he achieved so much, so he has a lot of experience. My model didn't work that well, so he's actually pretty young and he's just been successful. Okay? So that's how things work, and the same applies to the tests. Now, this is individual level. Now, group level, you might be looking at it, and probably from the back, you don't see the differences, and that's just because there are no difference. They are really close to each other. Okay? So you can see that when you use individual scores from each one of the children in Hungary, the group scores, they get really close. I mean, the difference is irrelevant, less than one ml kg per minute, and that's, that's very, very low, okay? So that's telling at the group level, my estimate actually gets really close to the score you're trying to predict, so that's really promising. So what are the implications when you classify children based on the two tests in the healthy fitness zones? You can see they're almost identical. So don't bother carrying a treadmill to the school, right? You'll get the same score. Either you'll be tested at the lab, either you'll be tested at the pacer. The score is fairly similar, and your classification will be identical, or very close at least. Okay? So that's what we found with the pacer. Overall conclusions. At the individual level, it's really promising. We can still do better, and it's promising. At the group level, you can get accurate estimates for groups of children, right? For a classroom, district, so on. Impact on health-related classifications. I mean, you saw that they were pretty much identical. Now, when you look at body composition, things are a little bit different, and they're not as high as, as we found for the pacer, and that's actually kind of expected. Oh. Why is that happening? Okay, here we go. Well, individual level, and we did this for separately for boys and girls, just because we found they are different when you look at body composition. They are different in other things as well, but we found specific difference in this assessment. And you can see that on the left panel that, you know, Boys, it works well at younger ages, but then as they get, as they get older, or uh, for higher scores, sorry, the scores start to, there's more variability. So that's kind of interesting. It doesn't work that well. But for girls, you can see that almost fit in a diagonal line. So that's showing that either you get one score with one assessment or the other, the scores are pretty much identical. So there's these things you need to think about. Boys can do better, girls works well. Okay? Now, at the group level, you can see again, oops, at the group level, you can see again, different from the aerobic capacity, right? On the left, for boys, you can see that there are some implications on what other assessment you use for bioimpedance analysis, 
okay? If you lose one test, you probably have less people in the healthy fitness zone, so that's 4.1, top red, right? But if you use the other tests, as more commonly used in the field, you might get 12.4, okay? So those are some applications. With girls, interesting enough, the score was exactly the same. In the healthy fitness zone, no matter what assessment you use, the score will be identical. But it changes when you start looking at the, healthy, at the other zones, at the needs improvement zones. So things we need to consider. But that's body composition. So again, and using the same structure, individual level, boys can be improved and should be improved. Group level, it gets close enough, but there's still some concerns. And apparently it has some implications for when you're classifying these children in the healthy fitness zones or needs improvement. All right, so um, there's big, three big pieces of information to take out of this, all right? We found strong evidence that the standards do have utility for the Hungarian population, okay? So that's, that's really exciting. Second, that these tests can actually be very useful when you're, predicting the, when you're predicting aerobic capacity or body composition in groups of children, okay? And that applies again for a full classroom, for a district, for a state, for a country, or for a continent. Who knows if we start talking about international platforms, okay? So that's really interesting. And finally, I mean, this opens up really unique opportunities to start promoting the international fitness test platform. We've been talking about that a lot. So the results kind of support that idea. And that's why we've been getting into this for a while already. All right? So that's all I had to show you in terms of evidence. I'll pass it on now to Greg. Greg Welk. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure now to be able to share with you kind of how these, the data that we collected um, can be used to understand the populations of uh, fitness in Hungarian, in this Hungarian sample and how it compares um, to a sample of, of U.S. children. It's not a representative sample, but I'll show you some data that we have um, from U.S. children because I'm sure that's of, of interest. Um, so I guess the, the three components of my presentation will be to first show you how we conceptualize the development of the NetFit software to be parallel to what we already have done in Fitnessgram. So Pedro showed you um, the detailed analyses of, of the testing of the standards, and I'll show you how we can develop, use that to inform the development of the NetFit software and the standards. And then I'll show you um, how that data is used to understand the patterns of fitness in the Hungarian sample in the U.S. So on the left shows a conceptual picture of fitness gram, and Dr. Cooper showed uh, that picture, and then uh, Zoltan also showed you the, the net fit. So that was our task, to take the fitness gram model and see how it would work in a, in a different population. And again, Pedro showed you good evidence that the standards work um, in this Hungarian sample. Um, and we produced this in a, in a report and summarized all the different standards. We're actually working on a, a supplement that'll come out that'll um, summarize the validation of all the different tests and the, the standards that were, were tested. Um, so that's still in the work. Uh, but then we also worked on um, how the information would be put into feedback messages that would be needed to inform the software development. So Pedro showed a little bit about this, but I wanted to show you a, li a little bit more detail. So if you use the same colors that are used in NetFit, green, yellow, and red, green would refer to the healthy fitness zone. And so there's a table of standards there. And if children, again, score above those standards, then we would apply a certain message. If they fall below the red zone, then we'd provide the children with a different message. And this is a really unique aspect of Fitnessgram because each child receives customized information on how they perform on each test, not just on overall or not compared to percentile norms, but compared to their individual health profile. Um, if they score in the middle, then they also get kind of an intermediate message. So the, the general concept of this is that separate scripts are prepared for each item based on that child's score. And again, these are written in English and then translated into Hungarian, but you know, if your score, it's, you would say your aerobic score is in the lower range of the needs improvement zone, participating in regular physical activity will help to improve your aerobic fitness and health. Try to get at least 60 minutes a day. And that's just a conceptual message of what we would provide to a child that was in that needs improvement zone. It's still encouraging, but it's letting them know that their score is in the lower range and they should try to be more active. In the green zone, you know, we would reward them and say this is a desirable range. However, you still need to maintain your involvement in physical activity. So both children receive encouraging messages, but just provided um, in a customized way based on their fitness. And again, this is done for each of the components of fitness. So you see at the top, for aerobic capacity, a child could have good aerobic capacity, but maybe lower 
muscular fitness uh, parameters or flexibility. And so the, the individual presentation of the report is customized in each panel. Um, so that's what the unique uh, feature of the software is, is that the software takes each child's data and provides a personalized report for that child. Um, and that's, again, what is unique about Fitnessgram and, and the message that goes home. Um, so I thought that would be interesting for you to at least see. So now we want to uh, share the results of the field testing in, in, the, in the population. So again, Pedro showed the data from the combined lab and field assessment. Now I'll be focusing on the larger sample of kids that completed the field testing. Um, so again, we applied the, uh, st the standard processing model we use in a lot of our data. So one unique feature about that is because our team processes a lot of this data, we're uh, familiar with. Um, the caveats and, and ways of doing that, and we process the data in the same way that we would process our U.S. sample to ensure some comparability. Uh, the samples aren't necessarily the same because the Hungarian sample is truly representative and our U.S. data is not. Um, however, uh, it still provides some, uh, some way to compare. Um, so one uh, way we looked at this is to compare um, by age, gender, and also region. Um, so we took region as an interesting parameter because, like in any country, there's differences in um, where people live, in socioeconomic status in different regions, in sizes of cities, the geography of those areas, and so we thought that would be very interesting for you to see. So I'll be showing you a series of plots that show age, gender, and regional distributions of fitness on a sample of tests. We didn't have time to show you every test, um, but we'll show you a, a sample of um, some of the main tests, and I picked the ones that we have comparable U.S. data on. So as I show you these graphs, you can kind of pay attention to the, uh, I guess, the overall patterns you see, and then the uh, age and gender uh, comparisons, and we'll see how they compare to the U.S. Um, just to orient all of you, I think um, we're going to be using these abbreviations for the different regions of Hungary. So in, it, we'll use CT and WT and um, so I just wanted to make sure all of you had the same orientation. Many of you are from Hungary, and these are obvious to you, but for those that are not, um, you can get a quick sense of, of the map. Uh, Central Hungary is where Budapest is, so that's CH, um, but there's other regions that have different abbreviations. So on the regional profiles, we'll just show the, the regional profile. And the main take-home message you'll see is that fitness patterns vary by region, and I think we, uh, that, that's of, of value. Um, so here's uh, some plots for aerobic capacity, and again, I'll show you a series that looks very similar to these. Um, so boys are in red and girls are in blue, and it goes from 11 to 18 years old across, and similar to what we see in the U.S. sample, a fitness tends to decline with age and tends to be higher in boys than girls. Um, so we've done some statistical analyses, and you can see there the, the pattern is, is significant, that there's a significant decline with age and also a difference between boys and girls. Now, for region, um, you'll see some, uh, quite a wide distribution of aerobic fitness patterns across the regions. And again, just to clarify, we're only plotting the percent that achieved the healthy fitness zone. So this would be school-level data of the percent of children that are above that green line for that test. So we didn't process or show the percents that are in the two different versions of the needs improvement zone, for example. It's only those children that are in the healthy fitness zone. But you'll see some natural variation, and your logical question would be, well, why do those patterns exist? And we'll uh, be able to explain some methods that could be used once this data is, is um, again, processed and analyzed over time to start looking at the explanation of these differences. Um, so then we'll show some similar patterns for body composition. There's not as much age-related difference across body composition, and actually the girls tend to score higher on percent achieving the healthy fitness zone in body composition. So this, it's important to note that that's the higher number, in this case, is better. It's the percent that achieved the healthy fitness zone for body composition, not an indicator of BMI, for example. So you see there's not real strong uh, age-related pattern there. Um, and similarly, there's not as much of a distribution uh, regional pattern um, that we see in this Hungarian sample. Okay, for muscular fitness, we'll show you two different plots, one for curl-ups and one for push-ups, two common batter tests that are also used in the U.S. Here again, you don't see much of an age-related pattern. You do see that the majority of kids can achieve the healthy fitness zone in more boys than girls. So it's almost up to 80% of uh, children that can achieve the curl-up standard, and that's similar to what we tend to see in the U.S. as well, with boys doing a little better than girls. 
Um, and there's kind of wide variety across the regions. This may be due to testing issues. So as Kevin was pointing out, um, different um, regions or schools might test differently than others. And some teachers might be more strict and count some curl ups, whereas others may not. And we find that in the US sample as well. So you have to remember that this is field data. Um, and the main goal of the, the field testing is to teach kids about fitness and, and to help them have a good positive experience. When we start applying this for surveillance, we have to take into account that it is field-based data. But it, it is possible that there could be regional differences in curl up, but again, we don't know. This is the first time we've looked at that. The, the differences look pretty wide there. So in terms of push-ups, uh, similar plots here. There's not as much variation across age and gender. Again, boys tend to do um, more, uh, higher percent achieve the standard than girls. And there's still this kind of distribution um, across regions with a little bit more variation by age and, or by gender in this case across regions. So again, this is interesting. It should lead to questions. And Waymo will talk a little bit about how we can then use this data to analyze why these regional patterns exist. Um, a couple more uh, plots on flexibility here. This is the back, saver, sit, and reach test. So there's um, some wide differences here um, in older adolescents, interestingly. So there's not much difference for the younger samples, 11 through 15, but you see from or 15 through 18 that the boys um, do much higher on flexibility than girls. And that's kind of opposite what we tend to see in the US. Um, there's some other factors that could explain uh, fit, fitness performances in adolescents versus children. It could be effort or motivation. Um, some things like that, uh, but those are different patterns than we usually think. We usually think of girls being a little more flexible. Um, and again, by region, there's some natural variability there. I might be going through these too fast, but um, I'm not <laughs> expecting you to absorb the, the direct comparisons between each country or each region, um, but just to get a general pulse. And again, the, the final reports have the details on all these and will eventually be published. Um, in terms of trunk extension, that's another test. Um, there's not much age-related pattern there. Um, in this case, girls tend to do a little better than boys. Um, and so you can see the majority, 40 to 60%, are achieving the healthy fitness zone in these cases. Um, and again, some d different patterns. So the, the, the higher level in the 60 to 80% for um, that middle region there, and so again, these may be testing issues about how, to, how the tests were conducted in each region, or maybe there's real differences, but again, that leads to hypotheses for future studies. Um, so again, I hope those provided um, some general summaries. Um, we took a, a, a brief over, overview of what we found. Um, so the odds of achieving the healthy fitness zone in central Hungary were greater than in northern Hungary and, and northern Great Plains regions for most of the assessments. And that was a, a fairly consistent pattern that we saw across the different tests. Um, but again, that, that, the next question would be why? What are those factors that might explain the differences and how can we reduce disparities across the country? So now I'll show you. Um, I guess a couple more summary slides. So we had uh, age trends for most assessments, and that's typical to what we find. And also that boys tend to achieve the healthy fitness zone more for some tests, but not for others. Um, again, VMI was higher for girls than boys. So now I'll show you uh, um, some results that we're finding in our sample of NFL Play 60 project. So this is a project that Dr. Cooper mentioned. It's a participatory research network of, of over 1,000 schools, and we've been following them for four or five years, and um, they've been submitting data. It's, again, a, a participatory network, so we're not going out testing the teacher or uh, testing the kids themselves. We're just providing virtual training to the schools. Um, but it's our, our best sample that we can share here today um, as, as we move forward. Again, I'm using similar plots of boys in red, uh, girls in blue, and you'll see the same kind of decline um, with age. The interesting thing is in the Hungarian sample, and it's hard to remember, um, your, the younger children, in, and this is plotted by grade instead of age, but our younger samples were only achieving uh, the healthy fitness zone, about 60% uh, were, but in the Hungarian sample, it was close to 80. So the, there was a higher percentage of your young children that were achieving the standards, but the end point of about 40% is similar. So your decline was a little steeper than in the US, but still we see this general pattern of a decline in aerobic fitness in both countries. BMI, like we showed before, is actually fairly similar in the Hungarian sample in the US, and also not much age-related variation. Um, this does not necessarily mean that obesity is not increasing, it just means that the, the percent achieving the healthy fitness zone is not um, different across age, and that's an important distinction. Um, 
again, uh, upper body strength uh, tended to be um, higher in this case in boys and girls. Again, not much variation across age in this test. And uh, the, in terms of the abdominal strength and endurance, th these values um, in the U.S. sample are actually a little higher than the Hungarian sample. Um, so it, again, varies by the familiarity of the test, perhaps, or um, other, other reasons. So we're still interested in exploring some of those differences. And flexibility was similar, uh, very little distribution, but you recall I was pointing out the lower levels in uh, the adolescent Hungarian sample for girls, and here we're, we are, we're having higher levels for um, boys and girls across those ages. Um, the trunk extension is similarly high for both countries, I think. So again, our uh, conclusions from this sample or, or overall were that uh, aerobic capacity and body composition tended to be higher in Hungarian children, um, but healthy zone rates for muscle fitness were, tended to be higher in the U.S. sample. So that's our first stab, stab at uh, giving some cross-cultural comparisons, and again, more detailed analyses has to be done. But the unique thing about the project and our efforts internationally is to begin looking at how countries compare using the same standards. Um, so I think that's where we're, we're very interested in moving in the future. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Weimu, and he's going to share with you some possibilities of how the data can be analyzed um, to answer these questions. So thanks. Okay. Now, the, um, Greg already said that uh, we find the region difference. So the, I think the people were interested in say why there's a difference or what makes a difference in the and how we can remove the difference. That's the typical thing we're interested in. And, uh, but you may think, you say, well, let's just run a correlation or regression and uh, have the school kids' data and correlate it with some uh, second level variables such as the number of the P, size of the gym, and whether the teacher, uh, P teacher is certified or not, and so on. But really not that uh, simple because uh, when you have the school data, the data usually is the, we call the cluster, or at a different level. You know, the, at the beginning level, maybe may the, um, could be the student, and then the class, and the school, the region, and then we have the international, will be the different countries. So the, the data itself is not that uh, simple. You know, say, for example, that just uh, uh, we, the Greg showed, say, where is the school, and the kids, and in the different school, in fact, some way they share some kind of same culture and the same PE teacher, similar gym, and in fact, also socioeconomic status often cross together. And so in this kind of data analysis, you cannot simply treat each kid independent. And in fact, this is one of the common uh, mistakes when the people analyze the data, they just uh, treat uh, these uh, 50 uh, kids as a N50 which is really not right, because uh, when you do that, that analysis, each uh, observation is supposed to be independent from each other. And uh, so when you get uh, further, say, the region, and then you get many different schools in the region. So Greg just showed the difference across the region. In fact, that within the region, you'll find a different school, all different from each other. And the question is why? And so. Uh, so the data is really is multi-level, or we call them nested together. And so the uh, traditional approach uh, really not uh, works very well. In fact, uh, if you're using the traditional regression, analysis variance, the kind of approach is wrong. And uh, because the data is not independent from each other. And the fortunately that uh, from the you know, the really the sick, uh, 80s, there's a new group of the uh, method has been developed. It's uh, uh, kind of, re people call it at first the regression to regression, and, uh, uh, but now it's more called a multi-level uh, analyze. So the idea here is this. So you can like see the, there's uh, uh, many, so each school has different uh, slopes and intercepts. Thank you very much. Uh, so really that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a different. Now the question again, why? Why the mean is different? Why the 
the change is different. So the, we're using the, the new method to really say, OK, the first level, we use the mean and uh, as the second level is dependent variable. So like we run regression to regression. So let's say the first level, we run the age and their performance, say the fitness. And then the second level, we'll use the mean of the each school as the dependent variable, and then use the second level. We say, well, maybe the school uh, level predictor, say number of the PE each week, and size of the PE, the ratio of the PE teacher and uh, student, and so on. So you can use that, try to explain the difference. So that's the, the method and we use. And in fact, at uh, uh, 97, I did the similar study, used the uh, national data. We find really two factors, very important. One is uh, whether the teacher is uh, PE certified. You know, in the US, some schools still just uh, some like a math teacher, English teacher, they teach PE, especially at the elementary school. The second one is whether they have uh, using the fitness test. So that's like two variable, very important. Then we have the Texas uh, data analysis. We find that socioeconomic status is very, very important. So it'd be interesting that, uh, like the, um, Greg just said, you know, the north part of the Hungary sounds like more fit. It's interesting too, like in China, it's also the north part of the um, kids more fit than the south. But uh, um, the, um, in the US, uh, it's kind of similar, you know, the, the more obesity in the south. So it'll be interesting to see all this, uh, the uh, reason. And so the, this is just kind of more like when you run all this model, how do you put this two level model? And uh, for your data, we really we're thinking to run like three level model. So the school, region, and then the children, of course, at the level one. And uh, uh, we're still, for this part, we're still, you know, the uh, process data. In fact, I'm going to meet Thomas about uh, some of uh, uh, the data we collected and try to understand. So in just a quick summary that uh, when you try to understand the difference and uh, we need uh, using the new approach, uh, more like a multi-level data analysis. And the benefit there is not only we know what is the difference, and we try to figure out what is the predictor, what is the key factor to make that a difference. And uh, then we know, okay, if we do the intervention, if we need to train PE teacher, if we increase the gym size, if we need to reduce the teacher and the student ratio, and then you, you do the intervention with uh, direction. The second part is also very important, using this kind of model is, uh, then you can really try to figure out what is the key part to uh, make the, the, the student learning, student growth. The bottom line of the school is to help the kids change, to move, to learn. And uh, in the US, there really there's a new kind of approach that uh, we call the growth percentile. It really is you compare the kids with their same kind of starting level, and in the next year, do you meet that uh, standard? Say you, at the beginning, you're 30 percentile, and then you you look at all the region data, say, if you're at this level, next year you're supposed to improve how many? And then, so you compare the uh, kids with the same starting point, and which is very important because if there's a region overall, like the US, uh, there's a certain region, there'll be you know, the minority group and uh, uh, obesity rate is very high. Would well, be not really fair to say, well, that's the problem of PE teacher. PE teacher work very hard, but uh, they have many students starting at a very low level. So using that kind of approach also can be very objective to major student learning and uh, give a very fair evaluation to the teacher. So that's the uh, new approach is coming. And I think I turn to the um, slide to, oh, and it's just a very quick summary. I already said that part, okay. And uh, bring the testing back. It's good to be up here again with you. Um, thank you, Waymu. And um, just a little bit about myself prior to coming to the Cooper Institute. 
I used to work um, in a role at the school district level in supporting the physical educators in our school district. And prior to that, I was a physical educator myself. So I come to this, the data view, uh, with a little bit different perspective than, than our researchers that you just heard from. Um, in both of these roles, we were in my school district, we were required to conduct the annual fitness assessments. I think one component that we, as a profession, we felt um, needed improvement was not just how we place the assessment in context of a quality physical education program, but also what do you do with the data once you have it. So um, again, it, in educating, um, first we thought it was very important to, for our, our educators to understand this fitness education process. As you can see, the assessment is just one piece of a process. Um, we must ensure that they have, um, they have prepared the students and they provide opportunities for practice to ensure success. And then after the assessment, to ensure that you utilize the fitness data in impactful and effective ways. Um, Wayman mentioned how our students are nested, and it's, and it's very true. Our students are nested in their families, which are nested in school communities, and then at the regional, state, and, and national levels. And preparing the school community um, and also sharing the data in useful ways, the physical educator is the middleman. I mean, it's, it's such a, um, an impactful role that they can play in the schools. It's a great opportunity. It is also important that they communicate to each stakeholder the role that they play in the fitness education process. The fitness levels of youth do not begin and end in the physical education classroom. And by communicating this with each stakeholder, we can work together. This comprehensive approach, facilitated by the PE teacher again, involves everyone in aligning these collective efforts to improve the health of a school community. So at the teacher level, the data, um, based on the class and grade level, a teacher can identify areas of need for their students. Lessons and activities can then be planned to target these areas of need. Just as a classroom teacher does when they're looking at math or science or language arts data, a physical educator can look at their data to identify areas that need improvement at the group level. It's equally important to pay attention to the outliers. I have the uh, inspect what you expect. Before sharing this data, especially at the individual level, it's very important for an educator to, to review and analyze their own data. This type of report can truly help guide a teacher with their whole group and their whole year's worth of lessons. With the student level data, it's important for that one-on-one -on -one communication to occur. The student must have the knowledge behind why they're being tested for the, in order to motivate them for the test or for, for the, to do anything with the results once it's given to them. These reports can serve as a communication link between the students and the teachers, and it's an objective report. It takes the subjectivity out of it, which is very important when you're communicating with your students on, on possibly sensitive issues. Students can use their NetFit results to learn about their own fitness levels and set short and long-term goals. Um, our philosophy has always been with FitnessGram that process goals are more important than outcome goals. Um, there's different roles of assessment in, in education. There's assessment of learning, which would be maybe a standardized test at the end of the year. But we always, we feel that our health-related data is the assessment for learning. So definitely looking at it within the educational process. The supporting student interface with the software explains the philosophy behind NetFit and also provides, um, and the Healthy Fitness Zone standards, and then provides resources for that student and their families to live a more active life. In sharing with parents, it is critical to communicate to the parents throughout the fitness education process, not just sending the reports home in isolation, or worse yet, not sending reports home at all. A parent should know why his or her child is participating in the fitness education process, what the assessment entails and measures, and then, of course, to provide the resources on how they might maintain or improve their health. This proactive approach means a physical education teacher 
um, needs to communicate again with that parent before, during, and after. This, we have found, really ensures that you have the administrative support, especially if there's um, any concerns from the parents, that, there's, that there's, the communication has happened. Use of parent-teacher conference night to discuss this is also a very great strategy in, in having the reports right there and, and having, again, a one-on-one -on -one objective conversation with a parent and their student about their fitness levels. School-level data. There are many informative resources. Uh, physical education can teach with administrators and for advocating for fitness. Um, a snapshot of that school's health, basically, their health-related fitness of their students, a picture can say a thousand words. Principals, administrators, they live and breathe in data, especially with their academic scores. And so showing them concrete data on their students' health-related fitness can really advocate for your programming and, again, show the importance of your role in the school. As a physical educator, um, their role should really be as the expert to assist their administrators in, in providing um, perhaps messaging for announcements or newsletters, any type of communique that might go out from that school, um, assisting them in planning and implementing health initiatives that that, that school can participate in. And um, of course, sharing the resources and the understanding of that healthy fitness levels and the impact that has on student learning. I mean, there's more than 250, 300 uh, research and evidence-based um, or research-based articles now that show the connection between health and student learning and the, the fact that healthy students do make better learners. I mean, administrators will buy into this if, the, if they know the facts behind this. And sharing with your colleagues. As a teacher, this is a great opportunity to inform your colleagues on the importance of daily physical activity. Um, you can suggest ways that they can help their students reach the, reach the 60 minutes a day. Um, a physical education, a education teacher should share and educate their colleagues on the importance of this learning connection. Um, it really can create the buy-in that it in, starts to begin that whole comprehensive school physical activity program that Dr. Castelli spoke about the other day. You need to have the buy-in from your colleagues, whether it's, it's um, and then provide them the resources if it's physical activity breaks during the day, um, ensuring that recess occurs, and, and hitting these different points throughout the day, it really reinforces with the students the importance when they're hearing it from not just their physical educator, but also from their classroom teacher or the, the health services provider on that campus. Our community outreach, um, when community organizations are aware of students' goals or schools' health initiatives, they're able to reach the child and parent outside of that school day to offer additional opportunities or support to help that school achieve their goals. Together, the collective impact a community can have, it can accomplish so much more than just an individual organization alone. Um, a physical educator sometimes is a sole individual. There may not be a whole team of them on a campus. And so soliciting the support of a local university to um, assist with actual assessment or um, community health fairs, different things like this. Having that data, again, the snapshot, that picture worth a thousand words. When you go to your business community and your community leaders, they can really rally behind you and support your cause. Um, as Waymo mentioned as well, the regional data, um, it can really be used to accelerate change and validate the need for policy and support at the regional level. By providing detailed statistical reports that graph and aggregate data across administrative units, test items, or grade levels, the software can allow for a collection of accurate and comprehensive records over time. Um, this can be used at the state level to track trends, investigate associations with academic achievement, um, socioeconomic status, incidence of discipline, uh, referrals, different uh, variables like this that can, again, pr provide proof and uh, advocacy efforts towards stronger physical education programs. And in summary, the data it really does drive decisions. NetFit offers just that. 
It can provide the concrete individual and group data that can be used to create influential reports. In physical education classes, fitness assessment and measurement without reporting or a plan to use that data really does little to serve students' needs and is not an ed educationally sound practice. So if we're going to collect the data, it, we can be using it at all these different levels to truly make a difference. And uh, I conclude with that. Again, uh, thank you to my colleagues for your, for your presentation and to all of you for your, your kind attention. Thank you.